Shalom. Uh, I'm Kevin. I'm the YouTube guy. As uh, you just mentioned, I'll be, I'll be the entertainment for today, um, naturally. So uh, I'm the trends manager at YouTube, and so we're going to talk a little bit about, about this concept of viral, right? And um, I think it's actually a good, a good follow-up from the presentation we just saw. Uh, so I manage uh, community and, and social as well as um, for YouTube, as well as the YouTube Trends Project, which uh, seeks to do this one uh, simple but also very complicated thing, which is to understand what's happening on YouTube every day. Right? It's kind of a ridiculous concept to begin with, but it's actually, it's actually quite hard. And um, it's so hard because 72 hours of video get uploaded to YouTube every minute now. That's the, the number that we're at, which is uh, more than one hour every second that gets uploaded. And these videos are seen four billion times per day, and the global audience is, is massive. It's 800 million users, uh, over 800 million users per month on, on the site. And, and all this came from a very, very simple idea, right, which was to make the sharing and posting of videos a little bit easier, right? That was seven years ago. Uh, we just had our seventh birthday. Um, this past month. And there are a lot of different ways, when you start looking at the data, there are a lot of different ways that videos get views on YouTube, right? Uh, search is still a very powerful thing. We're, we're a massive search engine. Um, subscriptions are a major part of our, our ecosystem, and that's how a lot of the most popular people on YouTube get a lot of views. But there's, there's one very specific kind of way that something gets views that we're all very fascinated by and um, that we're going to talk about today. And because I'm, I'm the trends guy, people constantly ask me this question. They say, you know, what is viral? How do, how do I make something viral? What is, why is that thing viral? And um, most people can, cannot explain this, and uh, maybe I'm one of them. But uh, here's, here's an example um, of what I'm talking about. Have you heard of the term viral video? Of course. Oh, yeah, I've heard the term. What does that mean? Oh, it's contagious. Not by a professional that for some reason gets extremely popular. Millions and millions of people watching. It went viral, just like they said with Justin Beavers. Why do they call it a viral video, though? It's not from the word virus, because that would be illness. Uh, but what does a virus do? A virus spreads. Oh! <laughs> I love that lady. All right, so there's a lot of differing opinions in, in that there, right? But interestingly, none of those people are, are technically wrong, to be honest, because the answer is that there, there is no definition of the word viral. There's no real data definition. Um, and some people are frustrated by this um, because they make a living off of it. But um, I, I kind of think about it as, as a shorthand for a new entertainment, news, sometimes even education, consumption pattern that we've never had possible before. It's only possible because the technology that we have now allows this easy consume, react, share uh, ecosystem. And so it's one of the cool effects of what happens when you open up the power of video, which used to be you know, limited to a select group of, of people, um, to everybody. From a, a data perspective, we know it's some combination of these things, right? It's a combination of, of search, of, of a, a rise in viewership, uh, of, sh of very importantly sharing and embedding, right? But for the average person, it's just everybody's talking about it, and it's usually happening on the internet, and that's where it usually starts, but not always, right? Um, and this, this everybody's talking about it thing is, is really important because videos, especially on the web, are by nature very social, very community focused. And since the word viral is not specific, I always tell people there aren't any basic steps that you can just follow and, and achieve if you try hard enough. And so I think about it as a, a new kind of media that we should all be kind of excited about. Um, there are a lot of things that we can learn from this, and so we're going to watch a bunch of videos today. You've probably, seen, I imagine most of the people in here have seen a lot of these videos before, but I want you to think about them differently than you have in the past, right? I want you to think about what we can learn from these things, what, um, what's common between them that we can apply to our individual creative processes. And some of them are total accidents, right? And the people who created these things are very upfront about that. Some of them were just very lucky. Um, and you realize that the, the creator of these things is not always in charge of what happens. It's what follows after that that's important. So we're going to discuss how the most popular of the viral videos got so popular, and then what are the real lessons that are potentially useful to us from those things. Oh, oh my god! Oh my god! Oh, oh my god! Woo! Oh! 
This is actually my favorite vir viral video, right? It's the double rainbow video. You've probably seen it. So Bear Vasquez is the guy who created this. He captured it in, uh, outside of his home in Yosemite National Park. And it was one of the most viewed videos of 2010. It had, I think, 23 million views that year. Um, and this is a chart of what it looked like right when it first became popular. And um, this is Bear himself. This is what he looks like if you've never seen him before. Um, and he didn't intend to actually make a viral video. That wasn't not his intention. He, he says he knew it was going to be popular, but not that popular. I, I, I don't know how much he actually knew, but um, he, he, he was totally sober. Just want to point that out. And, um, and he, but the thing was, he wanted to just share this, ex, this spiritual experience he had had with Mother Earth, right? That was, that's why actually there's no ads running on that video, um, if you ever notice. He says you can't put an ad on God. That was his thing that he says. And I know this because I, I actually asked him about it myself. Um, and so he had actually posted the Double Rainbow video all the way back in January, which a lot of people don't realize. And um, he says that he owes it all to American TV host Jimmy Kimmel, who was one of the first people to post a tweet about it, right? And it spread from there, and um, he shared it on, on Twitter. And um, soon after, people, a lot of people started sharing this video. You, somebody maybe shared it with you. And um, then you, we started to see all these remixes of it. There's a very popular auto-tune version of this that you might have seen. Uh, and it remains a classic. It still gets a lot of views every day because it's this thing that people remember. It's nostalgic for them. It's, you, but it's also very unique and very funny. And there's still nothing that we've seen that's quite like that. Um, and so I take three things away from that story, right? And these are, these are things that I find to be common amongst a lot of our most popular stuff. And I'm not saying that these are the, 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 these are, there are always exceptions to the rule, right? There's a lot of exceptions to these things. And I'm not saying that these are the things that you need to latch on to if you want to succeed, because there's a lot of ways that you can, depending on what your success metric is, that you can achieve. But I look at, I think tastemakers are very important, right? We saw that with the Jimmy Kimmel thing. I think the community participation element, the people sharing it and the people making other versions of it, remixing it, are very important. And lastly, I think the reason that it's had such a, a long life is that it's very unexpected. It's very surprising. And um, tastemakers, which I think are actually very important in, that, in these, some of these scenarios, are not essential to the spread of a video. I should be clear about that, right? There's a lot of data that says that just person-to-person -person sharing can carry you a lot further than you know, targeting specific influencers. But um, they are very common in the most popular viral successes. And the reason is they help spread content very, very quickly right, to a larger audience. It's basic mathematics. Um, and the cool thing about the web now is that anybody can actually be a tastemaker. It's not just celebrities. It's um, you know, journalists, it's uh, bloggers, it's people who are experts. It could be actually a community that has a shared perspective, like Reddit. Uh, Reddit's a very popular way that, that some videos get popular now. And um, I think what's important is the trusted point of view that you get, and then also the wider audience that they provide. It's Friday, Friday, gotta get down on Friday. I'm not, I'm not gonna play this for very long, lest you be stuck in your head all day. Rebecca Black's Friday, one of the most popular videos of last year. The total number of views across the videos of it is around 200 million, um, which is pretty wild. This is the viewing chart of how it became popular um, when it first took off, and similar to the Double Rainbow, it kind of was posted in February and then took off in March. And it's a music video, so it has a, a little bit of a longer life, but also. Um, because it's a day of the week, it still gets views every Friday, right? And that's what these other things are. Um, and, but on, that, on that, that one day, she'll tell you that um, Tosh.0 picked it up. That was how she first saw that it was getting popular. Um, uh, there were a lot of blogs that were writing about it. Mystery Science Theater, the guy who created that, posted a tweet about it. He, um, there's, there's no, like, nobody knows who the first person to write a joke ever about Rebecca Black is, right? But we do know that all these people were sharing it, and it was spreading quickly from these, these nodes of people that day. And so what happened is that an individual or a group of tastemakers took this point of view and then they shared it with an audience who accelerated the process. And it became what we know it to be, right, which is a pop culture phenomenon and one that everybody had an opinion on, which is actually really important and we're going to return to that idea in a second. So this whole tastemaker phenomenon, especially for me, took a really big turn this past March, almost exactly one year after the Rebecca Black incident, if we could call it that. Um, a, a nonprofit organization actually leveraged this idea and then stunned everybody who's a purported expert in this, in this area. To level with you, this movie expires on December 31st, 2012. And its only purpose is to stop the rebel group, the LRA, 
and their leader, Joseph Coney. And I'm about to tell you exactly how we're going to do it. All right, that's Coney 2012. Um, it's a short activist film. If you haven't seen it, it's a short activist film about um, a warlord in, in Uganda. It had 30 million views in one day. And nothing that we've had has ever come that, come, even come close to that number, right? And I th something will su supersede it, right? I think that will definitely happen. But to date, we hadn't seen anything like that before. And this is a 30-minute documentary. So to give you a sense of scale, this was Double Rainbow, okay? And then we're going to compare that. This is Rebecca Black. So we can see these are, these are all about a year apart, okay? Uh, and this is Coney 2012. So how did they achieve that, right? Um, because this was, this was purposeful. Um, and uh, it's because they directly targeted, actually, and they're pretty open about it in that video, the most influential people on the web. In fact, five of the most 15 most followed people on social media posted, including Oprah, Rihanna, Justin Bieber, all in the course of about 24 hours. And the effect was this kind of uh, critical mass uh, of attention that made it a phenomenon that the news media or pretty much anybody with a Facebook feed could not ignore over that time. And so what, what is the lesson here that we can learn from, from those examples? And I don't think it's to get a celebrity to tweet your video. I mean, that wouldn't hurt, uh, yeah, of course, but uh, that's, not the re that's not the real lesson here, right? And uh, you, we don't always need a crazy spike in views to achieve what we're trying to achieve um, on any given project, right? Um, but in, in the cases that we do, the, the, during the creation process, you need to think a little bit about how influential people or just communities in general will, will respond to that content. And then... Um, beyond that, you need, I think that there's a real element of, of authentic amplification, right, that we have with these things. And we've, we've known this. This isn't a new concept, right? This is why we have PR for uh, campaigns, right, they, to spread them to different outlets who then can spread them with their audiences. And um, you can also, I mean, because, as I mentioned before, because so much traffic does get driven just person to person, I mean, ads are a good way to jumpstart something um, on the web. Uh, but what is important, what the, the, the central important thing there is that you have to get out and promote it. You can't just post it and then hope, right? That's what a lot of people want to do. They want to spend all the time in the creative and then just hope that it will succeed. Um, let's go back to, to Kony for a second. So 30 million views for a 30-minute documentary about a complicated situation in Africa, right? The most popular demographic, and not the only one that was watching it because it was popular amongst a lot of demographics, but the most popular demographic, females 13 to 17 years old. And they weren't just watching it because Justin Bieber had uh, tweeted it at them. They were also sharing it with each other. And w why did this happen, right? It was because it made them feel a part of the, an activist movement, right? Which when you're, a, when you're a young person is a very powerful feeling. And it made them feel like a part of a larger group. This is something that is a basic human thing. And so what's happened today is that as the technology has advanced, uh, the world has gotten a lot smaller, and the connection between the creator and the audience, or the content in the audience, has become a lot tighter. It, there's a, now a two-way form of communication that, is, that exists. And uh, it's an entirely new way of uh, providing creative expression that we've never had before. So suddenly, everybody has this, this partial ownership in a, in a shared pop culture, which is a really cool thing. I'm going to make you watch this first for a second here. Okay. How many people have, uh, have never seen this before? Raise your hand. Okay, a handful. So it's a, a looped animation with a looped tune behind it, and it's been played 75 million times on YouTube. And a lot of people, uh, you know, who, especially people who don't use the web a lot, find this to be very strange. And then I tell them that there's a 10-hour there's a version that has 15 million views. Um, this is, the animation for this, the original animation, was an animated GIF that was created by this guy. His name is Chris Torres. He's a, a comic book designer and, and artist. And um, then a, a student, I think it was a student in Texas, 
um, took that animated GIF and then set it to a Japanese, uh, what's called a Vocaloid song, right? And then uh, posted it on YouTube. And this is how most people react when they see it for the first time. I think I got the idea. How long this last? Well, I keep waiting for something to happen. Yeah. <laughs> is it going to keep going, or does it change colors or anything? Is this supposed to hypnotize me or something? Is it a way to test monitors to see how long it takes for someone to break it? It's like an old uh, record that got the needle got stuck. Stop. <laughs> I can't take any more of this. I can't take any more of this, she said. Well, uh, there was a lot more of this right afterwards. Um, because right after this thing started to take off, unlike anything that really we'd been able to see in the media before, different people all over the world started making these remixes of this video. And there are now around 100,000 Nian videos on YouTube. Right? There's even one for every country in the world, pretty much. And I'll, I'll just save everybody a quick Google search. So people were directly and creatively engaging with this in ways that we, we had never had possible before. And this is, these are all ridiculous, but sometimes they could actually be, I think, kind of beautiful. Most people really struggle to understand and explain this whole thing. This whole idea of a remix of a, of a participatory entertainment is fairly new and it's very confusing, especially if you're not familiar with the way web culture works. But I think that it exemplifies what's possible now. The world of advertising is beginning to feel these developments just as well. And here's an ad that you've certainly seen. Hello, ladies. Look at your man. Now back to me. Now back at your man. Now back to me. Sadly, he isn't me. But if he stopped using lady scented body wash and switched to Old Spice, he could smell like he's me. Look down. Back up. Where are you? You're on a boat with the man your man could smell like. What's in your hand? Back at me. I have it. It's an oyster with two tickets to that thing you love. Look again. The tickets are now diamonds. Anything is possible when your man smells like Old Spice and not a lady. I'm on a horse. So I think a lot of us remember the first time we saw this, right? And we we're like, wow, that was actually really hilarious, right? And you maybe you sent it to somebody else. Um, because it was more than just an ad, right? It, it struck this, this chord with people, and it, it actually built an entire community of people. And um, I, as many of, of you in here will remember, Old Spice, shortly after this, launched a social media video campaign. Uh, they posted 180 videos over three days. Uh, and those videos actually garnered 75 million views uh, to date. And many of these were successfully targeted at celebrities and, and other famous people, um, and as well as brands who had big social media followings, which speaks back to that, that tastemaker thing. Um, but it was actually a piece of entertainment, right? And it was one that people wanted to be a part of. We actually have, um, I think, 3,000 parodies of this video on, on YouTube right now. Hello, ladies. Look at your man! Now look at me. Back to your man. Now back to me. Sadly, he isn't me. But if he stopped using lady scented body wash and switched to Old Spice, he could smell like he's me. Look at that! Back up! You're on the set of Will It Blend with the man your man could blend like. What's in your hands? I've got it. It's a broom to clean your room. Look again! The water is now wine! Anything is possible when your man smells like World of Warcraft bar soap. I am on a horse. Moo! Cow. That's my favorite one, the Grover one. Uh, all right, so now, if we're going to be honest with each other, right, not everybody's going to make a homegrown version of your video. And, um, if, but if your aim is to engage, right, then the community must participate in some way. And so 
I like to say, you know, you need to think about how and why we share, right? Us, the, the people in this room, right? We, we share because we're invested in some way in that content. We either think it's entertaining and so we want to share that experience with somebody else or it, it elicits some emotion like, you know, um, like joy or whatever that may be. Uh, sometimes we want to identify ourselves with it, um, as in the case with Coney 2012. Sometimes it's a vanity thing, look how cool I am, you know. And um, sometimes it's about adding perspective, right? I have something to say about this and I want people to hear what I have to say about this thing. And that's why the Rebecca Black thing took off the way that it did. Um, it brought up this really interesting question, right, which was, how does the thing that everybody says they don't like become the most popular thing, right? And the, the answer is that we all, it, w the video itself mattered less than what we had to say about that video, right? And that became what it was about. It was about watching it and then telling somebody what you, whether you liked it or not or what, what the problem with it was or whatever that may be. And so everybody wants to be that, that cool guy, right, who has the, the cool new thing or has the interesting thing to say. And that's how these things get spread because there's value for them in sharing that. And with over an hour of video uploaded every second, only that which is truly unique and unexpected can have that level of impact. Let's stick with the, the, ad, uh, the ads again. Um, for years, for as long as I can remember, this is how razor blades were advertised to men. Sometimes you need a little push to let go of your Mach 3 razor until you discover Gillette Fusion. It has five blades based closer together to reduce pressure. Right, a lot of famous people in that ad, nothing particularly wrong with it. Um, and then earlier this year, a, uh, a startup decided to take an entirely different route to the same problem. Hi, I'm Mike, founder of DollarShaveClub.com. What is DollarShaveClub.com? Well, for a dollar a month, we send high quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. Each razor has stainless steel blades, an aloe vera lubricating strip, and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and 10 blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up. Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are gonna ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandro, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're gonna stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are DollarShaveClub.com, and the party is on. So, uh, that guy's name is he's Mike Dubin. Uh, he's actually the co-founder of that company, and he, he was an improvisational comedian uh, in his spare time in, uh, in California, I believe. He made this for $4,000, and um, he reportedly, that he, he shopped, he, Pass it around, uh, not on the web, but uh, during presentations, and he reportedly used it to raise a million dollars in seed funding for this company that he had, and he did it all before he even had put it online. He, he actually, I had read this thing that he actually was thinking about not posting it online and was convinced to do it. It has five million views on YouTube. People started connecting with it, they started sharing with it, sharing it, it's very funny, and they lined up. He had 12,000 paying customers in 48 hours after it got posted. So. Um, the investors, what they knew was that you, you couldn't approach a new medium like an old one, right? And they knew that this wasn't an ad. They knew it was actually content, content people would engage with. And, but not everything that we do can be funny and wild, right? Sometimes, depending on what it is that we're working with, we, don't have, we have some limitations. But I think the basic idea here is that the, the most inventive ideas have always been the most powerful, right? And they could take you from obscurity to fame around the entire world. This is... Um, core to the mythology of YouTube, right? And, you know, taking it into the entertainment world, we've seen tons of examples of this. Carmen was a, a local band in Boston. They did unconventional covers of hip-hop songs. They were performing in bars and in the street. I feel like I gotta get away, get away, get away. But I know that I don't, and I won't, and I'm sorry. 
rock cause you know I gotta win every day day See if they don't really really wanna pop me Just know that you will never flop me And I know that they could be a little cocky You ain't never gonna stop me Anytime I come at you you gotta sit it Then I gotta go and then I gotta get it Then I gotta blow and then I gotta shut up any little thing And you can even do it This is them performing on Newberry Street in Boston If you've, anybody's ever been there um, they began posting more produced and rehearsed versions on YouTube, and uh, you may have seen this one. This is them performing one of last year's most viewed videos of the year. And this is them performing um, just, uh, just a few months ago on national television in the United States on Saturday Night Live, which is well known to be a place where some of the coolest um, and biggest artists in the world are, are able to perform. This whole thing happened start to finish in less than one year. It's, uh, web video has given artists, creators, and, and brands great opportunities that have never been possible to us before in the world of media. Okay. Let's just pick the mother of all funk chords. Let's pick a ninth chord. Uh It's a funk mashup created by Kudiman. It's an entirely new form of, of music that we had not seen. He's a local producer from here in Tel Aviv. And uh, because of this video, he became globally known. So much so that Maroon 5 actually uh, reached out to him and sent him a bunch of footage from behind the scenes and in the studio and asked him to make something from it. So Kudiman, whose real name is Ophir Kutiel, was interviewed by Wired magazine about this whole thing, and he had this to say, I live in a small city, in a small neighborhood, in a small house, in a small country. I didn't expect it to get this big, this fast. It sometimes feels impossible to reach out to the world's music scene from Tel Aviv, but now it's all good. This is great. Now it's all good. In 2012, we have access to huge audiences and communities that we never had before. Geographic borders don't even matter. And we're all in a position to write completely new rules about what works and what doesn't. So, you know, if you're starting with this idea, I think you're starting in the wrong place. No one wants to hear it, but we actually all know that it's true, right? Which is the best starting point is to create good, interesting, authentic content. And content that people can connect to in some way and react to. So, when I think about and we all think about the, the tastemakers, the community participation, the unexpectedness that we see in all these, these videos. Um, keep in mind the things that we can actually learn from those and apply, right? With 72 hours a minute, uh, YouTube is a very, very, very big place. And if you don't get the word out, it's easy to get lost in that sea. And if your goal is to, in fact, tap uh, the broad social conversation, which is what is uh, common about a lot of these videos, Simply trying to go after the views doesn't really make sense at all because you're actually going after people, you're going after actual communities. And so you need to be able to connect, they need to be able to connect with that content in some way for it to be worth it to them, for them to share it. And finally, I think we need to forget about how things were done before. And I think we all know that content that is surprising and unexpected habitually performs very well and succeeds on the platform. And this is the hardest part of the process, but it's the unifying factor between all the most successful videos on YouTube. So I'll, I'll be totally honest, I'm, this room might be split in two on this whole thing, right? Many people may think that this presentation was very entertaining, which I'm fine with, and uh, that I'm full of nonsense, also fine with that. Um, other people may, uh, may think there's something actually to be learned here and that we, there is something that they can apply to what they're working on. But uh, either way, I would say that I would want everybody to remember that we've entered a new part of history in, in media, entertainment, and advertising. One where the, the formerly completely faceless audience is faceless no more and has more power than ever before. And that understanding and understanding 
the, these audiences and these communities is critical to future success on the web. Ta-da.